There we go. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Between Two Teachers, where we talk about the issues um, nationwide, state, and local, very, very local, uh, letting you know what's going on uh, in this area and the best practices. And um, so we've got a lot of news. We always have a lot of news. There's too much news. But uh, some of it's good, a lot of it is good. So we're yeah. gonna share that with you. Today is Monday, December the 11th and we haven't been around for a while. There were vacations and there were sicknesses and there were all kinds of things, but we're back. So uh, my name is Consuelo Lara. And my name is Madeline Cronenberg and this is episode 214 for those who are counting. Um, and I, and I will, be, will begin as always with our land acknowledgement. We pause to acknowledge that we have gathered on the ancestral territory of Hui Chin, which is part of the unceded land of the Chochenyo and Karkin speaking Muwekma Ohlone people. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. We offer our respect to their elders and all Ohlone people past and present. And we encourage you, all of you watching us, to join us in supporting their efforts to become recognized as a, uh, as a tribe, to become a federally recognized tribe and get the benefits that they would receive from that. And you can do that by Googling justice for Muwekma, and you'll be brought to a website that will give you information about how to support their efforts to become federally recognized. And also we, we encourage you to look at the traditional um, uh, tribally uh, acknowledged and uh, agreed to uh, Ohlone curriculum, which ex exists for teaching the background of the Ohlone people here in the Bay Area. And that uh, curriculum exists on the East Bay Parks website. You can go there and just Google it and on the Contra Costa uh, Board, uh, Contra Costa County Board of Education or Office of Education website. Yes, when you go to the website, there's a link that says about CCOE and you just click on there and you'll see land acknowledgement. And uh, it gives you so much background, especially if you're an agency looking for a way to uh, incorporate land acknowledgement. There's a lot of resources there for you too. So, and it's a wonderful the idea, more and more, I mean, we all need to do it. We just all need to do it. We've been doing it here at Between Two Teachers for, for a long time and we support everybody else who's adding land acknowledgements to their uh, to their meeting formats. Yeah. Um, so for us, we're, we're gonna start today and talk a little bit about uh, national news. And a piece of national news that was out there was about um, the fastest growing um, area, new area in education. And it's a fascinating, point that you know many years ago we wouldn't ne not necessarily have predicted but it's actually I think a, uh, a, a result of our experiences during the COVID pandemic and, and it's homeschooling throughout the country and in our local districts as well homeschooling has grown and it's because of Zoom and the ability to have teachers uh, available on Zoom it's also interestingly a, an opportunity for members of the teaching profession for teachers to be able to stay home and teach and be in the homeschooling um, world of online education. But homeschooling has grown exponentially across, probably across the globe, but certainly in the United States. And what happens is that, it, that the growth impacts us even more because we have declining enrollment because of the birth rate and the fact that there are fewer kids. So the more who are pulled out, the uh, fewer kids that are in, the, in our uh, district programs. But isn't it? It's interesting. Yeah, you know, and uh, homeschooling was always seemed like, um, you know, okay, for whatever reason, I can't join here, but I'll I'll kind of, it's kind of like the stopgap or, or something. Yeah. You could do. But now it seems like it's become some people's first choice. This is the way I want to get my education. So we, the educators, need to change kind of how we see that, how we prepare, how we, um, yeah, get that whole department together. It's not an afterthought anymore. It's some not at all. choice. And so we need to refine it and make it even better. And um, 
and understand that. I mean, that's going to be your rights, the pandemic, it's Zoom, it's all of that. And some people say, hey, I could stay home and get an education. Uh, and that's what they want to do. And so, more and more families are working at home. Oh, yes. Yep. yep. Right. So, and so all of these things have changed. The pandemic just instantly changed many, many things. And now how we are adapting to it is going to be, it's going to be the story of the, of the next decade. But part of that story is is going to be the growth is absolutely the growth of online education and homeschooling is is a huge part of that. So, uh, so, so that's something we'll we'll watch as we as we move forward. Um, another uh, issue I was going to talk about this is a, a, a under the under the culture wars uh, world is uh, something from uh, Virginia, the state of Virginia. Uh, and it comes to from the Founding Freedoms Law Center. And this just was an interesting, uh, an interesting issue that came up. In Virginia, uh, in, some, in a district in Virginia, there was a teacher, there is a teacher who um, felt that her, uh, who had religious objections to using biologically inaccurate pronouns. Uh, for her students, as well as uh, religious objections to under to uh, attending teacher training on LGBTQ issues. Mm, mm, mm. So she, um, the uh, this uh, a legal center sued on her behalf, and she won an accommodation from her district. So this is where we are. In, uh, in in uh, in in and we are going backwards in this, I think. Into, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, a little silver lining, I guess, would be instead of ignoring this topic and it being hush hush and we don't talk about it, this has become a, a front and center uh, yes. discussion, and so there's no more hiding it. You know. Yeah. The fact that these kids, they get bullied, they get all kinds of horrible things happen, happening to them. They need extra protections. And here there's adults, grown-ups, who don't want those protections for these children and somehow want to just negate their identity. And so it's so harmful to kids. But, it's, it's, but the, what we have here then is the extension of the adult's religious freedom. So what happens is, is that where does my religious freedom bump into your freedom to be who you are, right? That's, that's, that's the issue, right? And so that's the issue that this teacher brought forward. And, you know, in the past, the issue never came up because we simply ignored it. Right? There was no discussion around LGBT. It was, not, it was just never discussed, right? And, 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 and for some people, it was just simply immoral to begin with. So why would you even discuss it? So we've come this long way, but we still have to look at the, the tension between um, religious freedom and and uh, and and how and the freedom to be who you are and the, and the freedoms to not be bullied in, in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting, and I mean, this is where it should be a uh, discussion, open discussion about this. Um, I don't know what the answer is because you're right. It's like two different, I do have conflicting um, viewpoints and, and rights. Uh, so we've got to make it right. Yeah, we got to give it a lot of discussion because there is, you can come up with the ethical thing to do, you know, and it's just it. to children. But, it, but it's process, right? This is all about process. So this is what we're going to be talking about, the importance of discussion. Yeah. And uh, the other uh place that I wanted to mention where we've had that, where this has happened is in um, uh, ever, uh, in our uh, universities. So the yeah. first issue in the, there's a couple of things I want to talk about with our universities. And the first one is Evergreen University in Washington. And these are both, they, these both really fall under best practices. So Evergreen University, like many other universities in the country, but is shrinking. The, uh, or it was, we had declining enrollment. Fewer and fewer people were applying, students were applying. And 
the uh, staff was told to be ready for staff cuts because the uh, because the declining and we're not going to be able to have uh, the same size classes and so that we have to cut our classes. And so the faculty union came up with a suggestion which has turned out to be successful. And that is that they have, uh, they create a position, a faculty position um, to call all of the people who apply and have a conversation with prospective students. And that conversation, that that strategy of calling people, calling parents and students and talking about our school personally with faculty members has totally reversed their declining enrollment. And now that they now they are growing, their enrollment is growing. Isn't that something? So who did the calling? Do we know? <laughs> the teachers, the faculty. Oh, the teachers. All right. That's the whole thing. It wasn't just the HR. It was the faculty. <laughs> and the faculty recognized it had to be us because that's what people wanted to know. I want to talk to the person from HR. So it always makes a difference when the teacher makes the call. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they want to know. Yeah. I mean, even teaching, you know, elementary school, middle school, uh, when they, what made the big difference in behavior Oh well, the teacher called every child in the every parent in the classroom and talked to them, and continues to do that, good or bad. Not always a bad report, but just that is the whole exactly, exactly. But I mean, my, my, I shadowed my daughter years ago in middle school, and there were two classrooms. One classroom was the biology classroom, the hardest class in the in, this, in the school, seventh graders in biology, and they were. 100% on task and, and 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 doing their work. Same children walked across the hall and went into an English class, which, which literally had to have a police officer in it because they were unable to be in any way controlled, right? And they, so what you had was a group of students who totally respected the biology teacher and had no respect for the English teacher. And, and it was, I mean, it was so obvious. I mean, you, you couldn't miss it. And I remember saying to the biology teacher, well, I didn't have to say, because I knew this. The difference with the biology teacher is she did that. She called every family every night. And if it was to say, I am so pleased with your daughter. She's like doing a great job. Just wanted to check in to let you know that I'm watching and paying attention. Or if the message was something about, you know, she's struggling, she needs help. Uh, what can we, what can I do to help her get do better whatever the message was it got across that she cared yeah that's that's yeah. what that's that's it you know and it, it also occurs to me in this time of like well we posted it and oh we put a link and well the idea of getting some personal contact how powerful is that somebody exactly. called me up and actually talked to me or exactly. you know so why wouldn't you go to that college right so that's yes. why everybody's going to agree so yes. this is other colleges can look. Those of you watching us who work at other places and colleges, you can learn from this. You can put in a policy that would connect you with your students. And that's a big issue in the community college world right now. Oh. And it's across the board in uh, higher education. Yes, yes, absolutely. Very good. Good for them. All right, well, let's, let's move on to the county. Okay, so big news at the county. The county has been selected to participate in CSBA's workforce housing, uh, a cohort uh, for professional development about how the to proceed. California School Board Association, right? California School, School Board, Board Association. Okay. Um, I want to read the email that was announced this. Um, on behalf of CSBA and our partners in the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, they got the money, UCLA and UC Berkeley, we are excited to share that your LEA has been selected for the 2024 cohort of CSBA's Education Workforce Housing 101 Level Workshop Series. Oh, that means there's going to be other levels. Um, the full cohort is as follows. So these are other people who also were selected. Uh, besides Contra Costa County Office of Education, Newark Unified School District, Oxnard, Union High School District, Morongo Unified School District. 
where is Morongo? But, uh, oh, and Lompoc, we're that Lompoc Unified School District. So those are the ones. Congratulations to you and your colleagues. So I'm assuming we'll be in the same um, uh, classes together. Details for the first virtual session in January and pre-work guidance will be distributed in the coming weeks. A full day in-person session and guided tour is in the planning station stages with Jefferson Union High School District for February in Daly City. That's important. And further scheduling conversations about future virtual and in-person sessions will take place as part of the first session. Please share this announcement with others on your team. So um, this is all out there and we're very excited about this. So to me, the next steps are, you know, putting that team together tightly um, and making sure they're ready to move forward. And um, we have a meeting this Wednesday. It's on discussion about this cohort is gonna be on there and we will see um, how what our next steps are gonna look like. So- It's uh, very exciting for Contra Costa County. I mean, Contra Costa County, as I have uh, said before, is a workforce housing desert. There is none. And it does exist in other places in California. It's not as if it's it's unheard of. It, it exists in Alameda, it exists in San Francisco, it exists in Daly City and on the peninsula, but not here. And so this is a big opportunity for our teachers and our education uh, 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 community to be able to have staff have the uh, an option for for reasonable housing. It it works to attract. Uh, attract staff and retain staff. And it addresses the critical housing needs that we have uh, across California and within Contra Costa County. So it's yeah. great news. It it's is great. great news. Great news for kids, for uh, for the students, for the schools, teachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's just a, a wonderful thing that's uh, that's happening. So we're looking forward to it. And my kind of vision is that uh, like first, I heard that a city council person approached a board member and said, what are you going to do? You know, workforce housing in our city, we want, you know, it would be good to say, you know, there's a place where you can get technical support, you can get professional development, and you can get a networking hub of other people who are, and that place is our county office. To me, that that's the dream. That is the dream. That's so, it. You know, um, yeah, we're working forward. This is just for, so, so what, what folks need to know is that the, 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 the state has changed the regulation to make it easier because they are looking to do everything they can to address the housing uh, crisis in California. And so this is one of the ways that they're doing that in, the, in, the, in Sacramento. And there's also a whole new set of opportunities for funding. And there are experts who are aware of those, and they have changed also because they have an underpinning that's built into, comes from statutes that are uh, created up at the state. And there are laws that are that have a time frame on them. So it's, it's because, and the reason they have a time frame is because they want us to move quickly and to address a, an issue that is a crisis today. So it's a, a CSBA, which has got funding from uh, partners with uh, uh, University of California and, and the Chan Zuckerberg people who have certainly got money um, to help fund it, have, have invested in, in helping make this happen throughout the state. And it's a great opportunity, great opportunity. So Absolutely. look forward to, yeah. to seeing the next steps and where, where it goes. Yeah, and uh, we there was a CSBA conference just this past week, and um, there were many other. Um, so CSBA they did their a presentation about um, the this training. There was also one I didn't get a chance to go about how school districts can uh, use their surplus real estate. Um, so this is an ongoing discussion, and how because. The fact of the matter is school districts have a lot of land that just kind of accumulates. And so how do we best utilize that for our, for our students to get teachers who can live in their, in the districts uh, where they work? 
So um, yeah, that that uh, conference was wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed, there were a couple things on um, uh, student board members, because we now have our two student, I'm all about the young people. We just, the more and more young people we get. Um, so I went to this one workshop and so they, uh, it, it was about what student board members can actually do and how they can, okay, they can't vote, but on a on an item, however, they can make a motion for people to vote on an item. Oh, that's great. You can bring stuff up that's really important. And um, so there was a lot of, and I sent that out to everybody to pass that on. Uh, so that was a that was a lot of fun to um, to participate in that. So um, let's see, what else did we have at the county? So this Wednesday is our meeting, and I'm hoping people will come and um, you know, listen in, see what's going on. And we're going to have new president, a board president, a vice president. That's also on our agenda. Um, yeah. And so discussion about this cohort and what we do next, what our next steps are going to be. So that's it locally. Then i leaving anything out here. Our retired teachers, we're going to meet again in January. I believe it's the 9th. I'll send out more information about that. Um, yeah. Those are the things happening. That's it. That's it for that. I, I want to do one more shout out. And we talked about the importance of communication. We live in a in a in a time where the uh, issues in the Middle East have have become overpowering for so many of us, and particularly for folks on campuses. And uh, just last week, there was a big uh, 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 conversation in Congress with some uh, university presidents about how our campuses are addressing the Israel-Gaza issues. And there is uh, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of bad practices here. There are a lot of things that are not working that are dividing people even more, uh, but there also are good practices. And one of the models of good practice is uh, Dartmouth. And this uh, Dartmouth, as, as the tension and division mount in much of the world, Campuses have become the focal point of anger and dissent. And so I'm reading from an article in Amanpour, but it's totally true. And at Dartmouth, the same thing was happening as at every other campus. But there, two of their professors, the chair of their Jewish studies department and the chair of their Middle Eastern studies department, created a forum, and they've done it twice so far, for students to discuss their thoughts. So they brought information and the professors then discussed it and, uh, and uh, uh, had conversations with them. Their forums had over a thousand people on Zoom for each of them. Not to mention the fact that the hall it was held in was also full. So it's something that people really want. And actually you can watch it, it's a, they, they uh, thank goodness, recorded it, and it's available on the uh, Dartmouth website. I'll link to it. Actually, I'll put it on, on our Between Two Teachers Facebook page so people can see it. Um, it's the example that more and more of us need to follow, especially around this very tragic and uh, complicated issue that is not going to disappear anytime soon. But what people do need is to understand it and our to, to, to continue to try to understand it. And that's the model here. That's the model that, that Dartmouth has. And I'm sure that it's not just Dartmouth that's done it. Dartmouth just got some uh, publicity because they they were so early in doing it and they're and they're one of the Ivies, right? And they, they were, they handled it very differently from Harvard and MIT and Penn who didn't go in and, that direction. And look at the numbers of people that attended tells you people are thirsty, hungry for information from intelligent people and uh, to be uh, reach out and get some kind of place where they can talk about it, hear about it, learn about it. 
that's what it's about. That's right. it. And that's, these are the students. These are Dartmouth students who attended, right? That's, I mean, now more people are learning about it, but this is the student community. So this was, a, this was an approach that really supported their student community. And that's why I really want to give a, a huge shout out to, to uh, both department chairs who understood that they, uh, that, that they could work together. And I know throughout the country, throughout the world, people are, different folks are coming together to, to try to do this. And this is just one example of, uh, of a university that's done it. And in this holiday season, this is what we have to focus on doing. Oh, yes, absolutely. This is very timely. So yeah. I hope people model that more and more across the nation. We need to have more discussion. So exactly. Very very so we'll have one, one more uh, between two teachers for 2023. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, then we'll take our our, uh, our uh, little winter break and come back in 2024. But we'll be back one more time next week on Between Two Teachers. So bye bye.